Greetings, everybody. Today we're going to be talking about ancient Egypt. And of course, with Egypt, we need to talk about the Nile. It's the longest river in the world, measuring 4,132 miles. The Nile is important because this is the water source for this rather arid area of the world. And just like we saw in Mesopotamia, this is where the development of major cities is going to be. In Mesopotamia, we saw the Tigris and Euphrates River, and now we've got the Nile. When we look at the map at the right, just a, a little note about the position of Lower and Upper Egypt. Lower Egypt is actually in the upper part of the screen. The Nile River is going to be flowing into the Mediterranean, and that's what's considered Lower Egypt. That delta area is fantastic for agricultural production. But it's also a very dangerous area because it has swamp-like conditions and we have hippopotami and crocodiles all kind of merging there. So it's very dangerous and we'll even see artwork where the pharaohs are engaged in hunting these animals. Upper Egypt is in the lower part of the screen near Abu Simbel and that is where King Narmer is going to be from, and he's going to conquer Lower Egypt, uniting this country or this civilization. Now, of course, Egypt is really the first great civilization we're going to cover. We're also going to cover Greece and Rome in the next few chapters. This, there is definitely a romantic sensibility when we think about Egypt. Of course, we have King Tut and all those golden artifacts that were found in his tomb pyramids, curses, and of course, think of all the shows and books that talk about aliens. Now, Egyptians were able to create a long-lasting civilization and preserve a lot of their great monuments and artwork because their, their area was fairly protected from invasion. We either had desert or we had sea, so it was a very secure area compared to Mesopotamia, which it always seemed like they were under the threat of invasion. The Egyptian civilization that we look at lasts from about 3000 BC to 332 BC. 332 is when Alexander the Great is going to invade this area. And 3000 BC is roughly when the dynasties begin. The merging of Upper and Lower Egypt, and there were people living in this area as early as 5000 BC. When we look at Egyptian history, we break it down into roughly 30 dynasties, and we break it down even further into individual kings' reigns. And the list of those reigns was compiled by the priest and historian Manetho in 332 BC. There's four particular areas that we're going to look at. We'll look at pre-dynastic Egypt, and then we'll look at the early, middle, and late kingdoms. Now, with the pre-dynastic period, we're not really going to be too concerned with the years because they don't quite match up as we get into the early kingdom, there's kind of going to be a gap between early, middle, and late. And that's to be considered with, there was a lot of unrest. There was uh, political instability during those times. So there's some uh, periods of time in between these sections of history we're going to be looking at. So with the pre-dynastic era, we're going to look at it at roughly 30, at 3000 BC. And Egypt comes under one rule. Previous to this, as I had just mentioned, Egypt had been two kingdoms, the upper and lower parts of Egypt. Now, Upper Egypt, led by King Narmer, conquers Lower Egypt. And this is a really important artwork. You're going to see this throughout studies of art. This is called the Palette of King Narmer. And the left-hand image is the upper part of the palette. The, the right-hand image is the lower part. And this isn't too large. It kind of looks like a shield, but it isn't. It is a, a palette where you would mix eye makeup. 
and you would have that mixed right in the concave center right in this area between the necks of the intertwined animals. Now when we look at the top of the palette we're going to see the different registers here. Um, King Narmer is in the upper register and he's in heratic scale meaning he's larger than all the others here in line. Now we talked about heratic scale when we talked about the Middle East where we had the Steely of Naram Sin for instance. We had a supersized leader, he's the most important and it still resonates here with the Egyptians. You can see he's in kind of a uh, processional or some type of ceremony going on. He um, is going to be wearing the hat uh, of Upper Egypt. And you can see at the very far right that he has all the enemies that have been killed lined up here. And there's not really any sense of space, that's why they're vertical. And you can see their heads have been decapitated and placed between their feet. The name Narmer is also visible right here in the upper center where we've got Nar as the fish and Mer as the chisel down below. The cow on either side is representative of the god Hathor. In the middle register, we have the intertwined necks, which show the unification of both Upper and Lower Egypt. This is also where your eye makeup would be mixed. And in the bottom register, we have a bull breaking into a walled town and trampling an adversary. Now, this work is what's considered low relief or bas relief. Both of these have the figures raised off of the surface of the palette, but they're not really in a three-dimensional figural set at this point. We're going to see in the Greek and Roman civilizations that we have more three-dimensional carved figures that emerge from the background, and that's going to be noted as high relief. On the flip side of the palette, we have the king once again shown in heretic scale, and he's about to kill off an enemy, perhaps even the ruler of Lower Egypt with a mace. And below that are two enemies running away. We also have his servant holding the king's sandals, kind of shown on a different horizon line, more, much more in the distance. The falcon at the right is representative of the god Horus. And there's going to be kind of this relationship between the pharaoh and the gods. They are literally descendants of the gods, and so they're going to be pictured very close with them. Now, the Egyptian civilization has is the first one that deals with ideal proportions. And normally we associate this with something that the Greeks invented, but it was really the Egyptians, so that their artwork looks very, very similar. For instance, we have this grid-like pattern, and when you drew a figure, it was the rule that ankles had to be on the first level and knees located on the sixth, the navel on the thirteenth, shoulders at the nineteenth. The figures themselves are also pretty unique in that their faces are seen in profile, yet their torsos are turned to be a very frontal view, and then their legs are back in that profile view. So with the Old Kingdom, we're going to see the tombs, both mastabas and pyramids. Now, just like in the Mesopotamia area, religion plays a big part of Egyptian culture, and the idea of the afterlife is really important. Now, it's not going to be until about the Middle Kingdom where everyone gets an afterlife. In the Old Kingdom, it's very much about the pharaohs themselves. Egyptians believed in the life force called Ka, and this was the counterpart of the body that coexisted, and the Ka accompanied the body into the next world. 
We'll first take a look at mastabas, and these are complex tomb structures reserved for the rich and powerful. No commoner would have been buried in one of these. And normally these are one-story structures. However, in the case of the pyramid at Dozer, there is kind of like this pyramidal complex, and it's basically mastaba set on, one to on top of one another. Now with this image here, this is just the regular mastaba single story, and you can kind of see how protective they were of the body. The burial crypts are below, and they would be very, very tough to get to and loot. But this is the step pyramid, or the funerary complex at Djoser. And this is, you know, it's almost kind of reminiscent of the ziggurats that we see in the Middle East. Now down below also, this is where the secret chamber is going to be. And there would have been a, uh, uh, it was called a serdab, or basically cellar. And this would contain a statue of the deceased that would represent him to the spirit world. And these tombs would become more elaborate and complex. Additional rooms and as well as relief sculpture would be placed along the wall that showed kind of pictures of everyday life of these rulers. And then we have the Great Pyramids here, and the main things I would want you to know about them are the names. Uh, Khufu uh, would be the one at the far right, Khafre in the center, and then Minkari at the front left. The largest one is off to the right, and that is Khufu. Uh, it covers 13 acres at its base, height 481 feet, basically a football field and a half. And there would also have been originally a 33-foot high wall built around the pyramids. Next to each pyramid is a funerary temple, and the embalmed body of the pharaoh would be ferried, acro ferried across the Nile and then placed at the temple. It would then be carried up the causeway and placed in the pyramid. And welcome back. This is going to be part two of ancient Egypt, and we left off talking about some of the architectural features of the Old Kingdom, and now we're going to take a look at sculpture and pay particular attention to the sculpture of Khafre here. It is massive compared to the previous sculptures we've seen, such as Gudea of Lagash or the Woman of Elendorf. The sculpture is five and a half feet tall. It is over life size. You'll notice the god Horus behind the king's head there in the image at the right hand side of the screen. And the god has outstretched wings, kind of protecting the king or pharaoh. And this lends itself to the association we have between the god and the king. There's a lineage that is present here. Now, when we look at the lower part of the throne, we also have some relief sculpture here, and that shows both lotus and papyrus plants, again showing the association we have between both Upper and Lower Egypt. The king wears his traditional regalia, including a false beard, and the sculpture itself is made from a northosite, which is an extremely difficult material to carve. We used to think it was diorite, but just recently we figured out it was a northosite, which is a really kind of cool material, because if this was out in the sun, it would have glowed almost with a deep uh, blue color. But the king looks very dignified, and there's no negative space here because the, the material was so difficult to carve. So we don't have any space between the body and the throne or even among the parts of the body itself, whether it's the legs or the body and arms. It's all completely solid.
Now, heir to Khafre's throne is going to be Menkari, and he also has one of the three great pyramids. What's exciting about this sculpture is we have a little bit of emotion shown, and we won't see that till the very end of the Egyptian civilization with Akhenaten. But we also have an indication of movement where we have both the king and the queen with one foot in front of the other. And so instead of a very solid sculpture, we're trying to create, or at least the Egyptians are trying to create a little bit of dynamism here. Now that's definitely not going to be perfected until later on during the Greek civilizations. Again, they're created within the Egyptian, uh, Egyptian ideal. And once again, there is no negative space seen here. And some argue that the sculpture wasn't completely carved yet, but because the material is so difficult to carve, it wouldn't be uncommon for them just to leave it. Now, Pepe II and his mother is, uh, again, one of those great sculptures. It's much smaller than the previous ones that we saw. For instance, the, the sculpture of Khafre is five and a half feet. This one is only about 16 inches, not even a foot and a half tall. And it's made out of alabaster. What's great about Pepe II and his mother is that it looks very much like a Madonna and child painting here. The child wears the royal headdress and kilt, and really the, the sculpture pays homage to the queen, who is acting as regent until her son is old enough to take over the throne. And here we do have some negative space, particularly we can see that between uh, the arm and the body here, as well as the legs and the throne. Another great sculpture from this time period is the seated scribe, and you can see it in the Louvre today. It is not at all the ideal that we have of how the king or pharaoh is presented as being perfect. Uh, here it's much more humanistic. It is a kind of a middle-aged, slightly overweight person. Uh, it is a smaller sculpture. It's definitely not life-sized, but it, it is quite fantastic. Originally, there would have been a, a pen in his right hand or some type of writing utensil, and we can still see the papyrus scroll uh, in his left. This person would have been very educated. In fact, we know who this person is. It's a government official named Kai, K-A-I. And he was very well educated. When we look at the sculpture from the right-hand side here, we can definitely see how the eyes make him look alive, and that is uh, really quite unique. And this is most likely a funerary sculpture, something meant for an interior of the tomb. Our final work of the Old Kingdom is Ty watching a hippopotamus hunt. And this is located on one of the interior walls of a mastaba. And this gentleman is a government official. And it's really showing him at during an official duty, uh, which is killing, hi killing hippopotamus, basically protecting the crops. And also we have the god Seth, who is the god of darkness, and he would many times disguise himself as a hippopotamus. Now, I didn't tell you uh, back when we talked about the palate of King Narmer, Narmer had been killed by a hippopotamus. That was the end of his life, unfortunately. Now we're going to move on to the Middle Kingdom. And here we have some really great jewelry, something we really haven't seen before and something that's incredibly aesthetically pleasing. This is the pictorial of Sanesret II, and I'll show you a close-up of this here. And again, it's incredibly beautiful. We have uh, two falcons, Horus, uh, perched on either side, and above their heads are two coiled cobras, the symbol of Ra, or the sun god. Each of the cobras wear an ankh, which is the symbol of life. 
and we also have <clears throat> a cartouche, an oval formed by a loop of rope in the center. And inside here is a symbol of Ra and a scarab along with Sennesaret's name in hieroglyphics. A kneeling male in the lower center holds palm branches and decoded it says, May the sun god give her eternal life to Sennesaret the second. It's very unique and it's very intricate and uh, here it is uh, on display in the museum. The Egyptians themselves were master goldsmiths and jewelry makers. This is a work of faience, which is glazed earthenware pottery, basically ceramics that are fired at a very low temperature. And this one, of course, is really fantastic. You'll see it in a lot of the art history books, just because it is so cool. And of course, uh, hippos we've already talked about. This one is... Uh, blue so it's kind of hidden as if it were in water and then we have the lotus blossoms uh, indicated on the body surface almost as if it was camouflage. Now our next pharaoh we're going to look at is Hatshepsut and this is one of the female pharaohs and we see her here as a, a sphinx but she is also uh, shown most commonly here uh, very much in the male guise as the ruler. Uh, in fact, she was one of the individuals who uh, ran Egypt uh, wonderfully. She isn't interested in the military expeditions, but rather focuses on prosperity and security of her country. She does declare herself king. The only thing she really doesn't wear is that false beard and people refer to her as Her Majesty. She does rule for 20 years from 1489 BC to 1469 and the funerary temple that she has is, is quite incredible. Um, but her son, Tutmos III, has her name chiseled off the structure. Uh, in fact, literally all the structures that she, she created in retaliation for keeping him off the throne for so long. And here is her funerary temple. And unfortunately, recently there was a, a terrorist attack that killed about 60 tourists that were visiting the site. But this is uh, a place that took 15 years to construct. And it was not originally intended to be her resting site. This was just a, a place for ceremonies. Uh, it's really a beautiful location nestled right into the hillside, as you can see. And today it's very barren. But there would have been sphinxes running up on either side of the causeway on the lower level. And going up the first ramp, there would have been pools of water and also rare trees and plants from faraway lands would also have been planted here. Had set up, uh, sent expeditions of ships to collect them. There were also shrines to the gods, both Hathor and Anubis. Among the other feats here were about 200 sculptures, all monumental in scale. And then we're going to take a look at the New Kingdom. Now, we have a lot of changes to the Egyptian civilization during this time. Basically, after this time period. We're going to see that the Egyptian civilization is in decline until it is conquered by Alexander the Great in 332 BC. But what happens during the New Kingdom is that the capital of Egypt changes to the city of Thebes because of this gentleman here, Akhenaten. He also changes the religion of Egypt from a polytheistic culture to one that is monotheistic. And Akhenaten translates into Aten is pleased and he and his wife are the only representatives of Aten on earth and of course this upsets the priesthood. 
Now we also look at his sculpture as being very unique compared to that of Khafre. Khafre is that of a, a ruler, has ideal proportions, is very formidable. Whereas Akhenaten is not, it's almost as if he uh, was female. And we can kind of see this graceful curve to his body, how white his hips are, how feminine his facial features are. And this is also a time where we have, again, a motion scene where he and his wife are caring for their three children. And of course, art changes radically during this reign because we have a very informal setting. Again, we have figures, though, that have swollen bellies or elongated skulls, thin arms, and there's a lot of argument as to if there was something medically wrong with this strain of the family. Aten is also present in this image as the sun disk, and the thrones that they're sitting on indicate that he and his wife, Nefertiti, ruled Egypt together. Now the queen's portrait bust here is one of the most beautiful works, and we're going to go ahead and discuss that in part three of this video. And welcome to part three of our lecture on ancient Egypt. Now we left off talking about Queen Nefertiti. And this sculpture is about 20 inches high, so it's about life-sized. And it's done in full color. It's made out of limestone. And this one is unique because we don't really know its significance, that perhaps this was... Uh, a bust for uh, an even larger sculpture or a different sculpture that was going to be made in the Queen's likeness. It was found in the artist's studio of Tutmos. Now, Queen Nefertiti dies at the age of 41, and as far as art is concerned, Akhenaten creates this new figural style in which much more detail was placed towards the human body. No longer did Egyptian figures look like the, the palette of King Narmer, for instance. They become very lifelike, very individual, rather than something that is ideal. The queen's face itself is symmetrical, that there's this long neck and high cheekbones, a new ideal of beauty as we just spoke on. And again, she is the wife of the pharaoh. They share power. And there she is in her own room in a museum in Berlin. There is a lot of controversy about this work as Egypt has asked for it back. Now, this style of art that we see that's unique is going to continue through the next pharaoh, which is King Tut. And what happens after Tut's death is that the style of art is going to revert back to the previous ways, at least for the next thousand years. With King Tut, we have the very first blockbuster exhibition. And that's called King Tut's Treasures. And it went on exhibition in the 1970s. And in 2005, it does happen again. The first time it went through, there were something like 8 million visitors. And I was fortunate enough to work at the LA County Museum of Art when it came through a second time. And I can tell you for six months, that's all that the museum was a buzz about. He is the last of his family dynasty, and he rules for only nine years, though he's considered a very minor king because very few objects have his name on them. Now, he's famous because his tomb was undisturbed. It was hidden in the Valley of the Kings. 
the Valley of the Kings is home to 62 tombs, and that is nearly all the pharaohs that reigned between 1539 and 1078 BC. The tomb is opened on November 25, 1922, after six years of excavation. What's exciting, though, is it takes another six years to empty the tomb of its 3,500 objects, chariots, clothes, jewelry, and weapons. Basically, the dates are November 4th, 1922, or when the steps are uncovered and work stops at that time. The patron, the person paying uh, to have this work done is Lord Carnarvon. And so he arrives on uh, November 24th, 1922, and work then resumes. And of course, November 25th is the day the tomb is actually opened. But after the six years it takes to empty the tomb, there's still about another five years spent on cataloging all the material that came out of it. Of course, we always hear about the tomb uh, or the curse of uh, Tutankhamun's tomb. And by 1929, 11 people connected with the opening of the tomb had died, including Lord Carnarvon, who died in 1923 from pneumonia. Carnarvon's wife had died of an insect bite. Another guy, George Benedite, dies from a fall. We have Arthur Mace, who passes away. Two of the figures committed suicide. By 1935, 21 people had died, including one that went insane. Carter, he opened the tomb. He lived until the age of 66. But his canary that he had as a pet was eaten by a cobra. And here are some pictures of the tomb itself. Here we have the Temple of Ramses II. Ramses is believed to be the pharaoh of the biblical story of Moses and Exodus. He was a very bold military commander and very politically shrewd. The renovation and reconstruction of the temple here moved to higher ground between the years of 1964 and 1969, cost $90 million, and 5,000 people worked on this project. It was a multinational effort. Ramses II is going to reign for 67 years, but the mummy that we have of his suggests that he died more closer to the age of 59. It was rumored, though, he had 100 children. And there we have the mummy. The smaller temple we just saw was 500 feet away from the original. And I thought it'd be a good time to talk about mummification. Uh, it most likely evolved as a matter of public health, with cremation being impractical on a large scale and burial impossible because of the flooding of the Nile River. It was a long and costly process, and first the brain would have to be removed and the skull dissolved, internal organs removed, eyes would be removed and replaced with enamel. The body then soaked in a solution for 70 days and then wrapped in resin bandage that were soaked in oils. The Egyptologist Samuel Birch calculated that over 420 million corpses had been embalmed, but with today's research, we indicate that it could be twice as many. And before 1900, brittle mummies were ground up for medicinal purposes, such as aspirin. They were also ground up and sold as fertilizer, blood meal, and bone meal which became a huge industry. In fact, in 1872, 10,000 tons of it was shipped to England. Now, after 332, Egypt is conquered by Alexander the Great. And I want to take just a moment to look at these mummy portraits. These are done during the Roman Empire, during the second century AD. And it's important because we need to talk about the 
painting medium that's used to create these, and it's called encaustic. It's really our oldest painting medium, and it's used in all the early civilizations we're going to cover, Greece, Rome, and of course Egypt. It's created by mixing the pigment with hot wax, and so you can imagine how cool, how quick the wax will cool. And so the artist has to work extremely quickly to finish. And the mummy portraits are really cool because these were basically painted while you were alive. And these would hang on the wall or be placed on the mantle, just like we do with images of the family today. After you died, they would be taken down, cut to shape, and then they would be placed on the outside of the mummy, kind of a morbid indication of who was inside. But this is something for, uh, again, for you to note that encaustic is a very thick, very viscous, waxy type of medium that, again, we're going to see in the next few chapters. Uh, and with that, we're going to end our uh, lecture on ancient Egypt, and I will see you again shortly, and we'll talk about uh, the early Aegeans.